Can everybody hear me? As she said, I have been doing this. I have um, three acres in Connecticut and a 40 by 60 vegetable garden. And today I'm gonna to basically go over some really simple seed starting techniques. Has anybody here started plants from seed? Perfect. I'm gonna cover, first I'm gonna cover planting seeds indoors, which we're about at that time of the year where you wanna get those tomato plants started up. So if you haven't already done your tomatoes, we'll start there. Tomato plants, pepper plants, eggplant, those are what I call the long season vegetable crops that need, I like to back up eight to 10 weeks from when they're gonna go outside. Eight weeks that they're gonna live inside your house and then about, I like to give them two weeks of hardening off. And what that means is once they're, you know, little plants inside, you're gonna move them outside a little bit every day, bring them in at night, put them back out. For me in Connecticut, I look at frost-free middle of May. I'm assuming it's similar here, middle of May. Everybody wants to get to jump the gun, but really, until the nighttime temperatures are consistently above in the 50s, you really don't want to plant your vegetables outside. And once the nighttime temperatures get above 50, you can plant everything. So basically seed starting, the one thing that you, I like to use an assortment of containers, depending what I'm planting. The seed companies are great. You buy a packet of seed, you get excited, and it says 200 seeds. Don't plant 200 seeds of anything. So I like to use containers that manage the amount of seeds that I'm going to plant. So something like this I'll use for my tomatoes. I like to encourage people to grow a couple of cherry tomatoes, a couple of really good beef steaks or heirlooms, and then as many plum tomatoes as you want. So basically you want to clean your equipment. Um, a bucket of water with a couple of tablespoons of bleach is the perfect solution if you're recycling like I am. These are, you know, those nursery packs that you get your impatience or pansies in in the spring. I save them, I wash them, I recycle them. I'm using a mix of potting soil because we're um, coast of Maine, we make this amazing um, organic potting soil. But seed starting mixes, if you're not um, a professional who's done this a lot, you should probably go with a, um, a seed starting mix. The key is to have it moist when you put it in your container. Because I'm using potting soil, it already has some moisture. You wanna be able to hold it in your hands. So you don't, you know, if you buy that seed starting mix, it's very dry. So you would wet it first. And then you want to put it in your containers. Just fill your containers almost to the top. Now, like I said, I like to keep my containers small so that I'm not planting the whole packet of seeds. And the key with seeds, the, lar the seeds go in three times their size. So if you have a big seed, like a bean seed, that can go pretty deep. But if you have a little seed, like say a cucumber or a tomato, you really want to place them on the surface. So I like to make you know, a hole with my finger. And in something like this tray, I'm only gonna put 12 seedlings, two in each hole. And why I say two in each hole is because, oh, you can see above me, right? So I don't have, to, okay. In case one doesn't germinate. So I like to plant two seeds in each hole, inside when I'm planting and outside when I'm planting. But then when they germinate, if both of them happen to germinate, you need to cut that second one off. You just don't want the roots to get intertwined so that when you're separating them, you're gonna have any problems. So you're gonna put two seedlings in each hole. Then I like to lightly cover it. Don't overdo it, like I said, one, two to three times the, the depth, the size of the seed. Does everybody understand that idea, that concept? Oh, yes. The ones, if you have two germinating in the same hole, it, it's really tricky to try to separate them. 
and you might damage the stem. The other thing I want to point out is the plant, the stem is its, its lifeblood. You want to be really careful that you don't damage the stem of the plant because that's how it's going to bring its food from its roots into its leaves. So you really want to handle it by the leaves or by the roots. And one of the things I put in my notes is when you have your little plants, just touch them. They like to be touched. You know, when they're growing, in, it's kind of cool, too, to touch them like that. All right, so you're covering this. The key that a lot, a big mistake a lot of people make when they're starting seeds is they water from the top. I just missed the top of the soil, and I bottom water. So that's why they're in this kind of tray. And I'll line them up in a tray like this. This will hold six or the pea pots. And you want to put the water in the bottom. I like to mix, uh, Costa Maine makes this amazing worm castings. So I make a worm tea. So I'm actually feeding my plants worm tea instead of straight water. You can also use a diluted solution of fish fertilizer, depending on how sensitive you are to the odor. But this has no odor and it works great. Instead of giving your plants straight water from, um, from the get-go, I'm giving them the added nutrients. Worm castings have a lot of calcium in them, so it's really going to help your seedlings get off to a good start. Then the doming part is, you know, this is just to keep, keep the moisture in. Tomatoes and peppers especially, you really need to invest in a heat mat. Or if you have a refrigerator that's really warm on the top or a hot water heater you can get to. Bottom heat is critical at this point in their development. Until the first set of leaves germinate, you really want to keep them, um, they need about 85 degrees to, to really start to germinate. And tomatoes are going to take about, you should see some life after eight to 10 days. So you're going to keep this on the other thing I caution people, has anybody ever used these dome seed starting? You notice some moisture collects on the inside. It's critical to get rid of that. I always tell people, don't let them sit in water. Water them, fill this with water, with the worm tea or a fish solution. You'll watch the water. You can see the soil change color as the water seeps up from the bottom and your seedlings are now in a nice, damp environment and then if the tops if you look at you don't want them to sit in water so you'll drain the track you'll put them back in you'll cover them you'll let them sit like that at this point all that matters is they have a warm bottom that's really important then you watch it every day you take this off you let them get some air circulation if the top looks dry you spritz it they cannot dry out because you got to remember those seeds are right here on the top of the surface and they need that water to make the soil work so that they're going to germinate. Any questions so far on that part of it? I, you can buy, I buy the gardening heating pads, but you can use a normal heating pad. That would be fine. Uh, they make heat, yeah, they make heat trays, you know, heating pads for gardeners. They're really durable, and I have to say mine is 20 years old, so it's an investment, but it lasts a long time. So if you're serious about growing tomatoes or peppers or eggplant, any of the long season crops, it's worth the investment. Okay, so now for the sake of, yes. Well, when they're germinating, it doesn't matter because the heat at the bottom and the water is what's critical. Okay, so now we're fast forwarding 10 days and you have your first set of leaves in here. You want to take this off. You want to take them off their heating pad and you want to give them 12 to 18 to 24 hours of light. It's really worth investing in those fluorescent light fixtures. If you're serious about seeds, a window is okay, but you have to pay attention if you put them in a sunny window, they're gonna to grow towards the light. So they're gonna be spindly. So you have to turn them all the time. But they really want, I have mine on a timer so that at night when the electricity um, costs a little bit less, I run it at night. So the lights, you know, I just bought one of those metal racks and I can adjust the fluorescent fixtures and they're on chains. So as the seedlings grow up, you can move them up. 
So they really, really work, and they're a really inexpensive way to have a little seed starting um, set up at home, and, the, and they last. So at this point, it's more important that they get light. So you have your little tomato plants, and they're about this high. And again, I like to tell you to go brush them, um, give them a little touching um, so that they feel good. Then when you're going to transplant them, what I said earlier, if you're having two germinated in every hole, you want to sacrifice one of those because it's really difficult to separate them and you don't want to hurt their, um, their stem. So when they get to be their second set of leaves, you know, they're about this big, I put them in a bigger container. So I'll take them out of here and then I'll use, that's when I'll mix the potting soil with the worm castings. Worm castings are like gold. They are the best thing you can give your plants. So I'll mix those two things and I'll put my little plant right in there. And then I'll leave them in the sun. I just put them under the lights or in the sunny window. And by May 15th, you'll have a really sturdy tomato plant. You just, at that point, you again, do ne I never water from the top. I cannot stress that enough. People who have started seeds, I don't know, sometimes you'll see a um, gray mold kind of on the top of your seed. It's, it's because too much moisture. That's the critical thing that you have to watch. You really have to be careful with um, overwatering them. Anybody on so far on tomatoes? Yep. The mold on the side of the pots is okay. It's not going to hurt the plant. I'm not a big fan of pea pots for starting tomatoes or peppers. Pea pots have their place for other things, and I'll talk about that, but they tend to dry out really quickly. If anybody here has used pea pots, they dry out really quickly. So these plastic pots are great. Um, and like I said, just make sure they're clean. Pea pots are good if you want to start snow peas or sweet peas, anything that tradition says you can plant directly into your garden by St. Patrick's Day. Well, we know better this year. Um, don't do it. If you put them out there this year, they're just going to not do anything because the ground is too cold and too wet. So that seed isn't going to make it. Pardon me? Did somebody say that? Oh. So I like to plant mine in pea pots because they don't like to be transplanted. So you can start your sweet peas and your snow peas now. You can go home and do it tonight. Um, just put two in each little pea pot, do the same technique, bottom water them. You can actually, I would say next week, you can already put them outside. So they'll be fine because they could take the colder temperatures, um, the early season crops like the lettuce and the spinach. Two weeks from now, you can start planting lettuce and spinach. So for outdoor beds, I'm saying that, you know, the temperatures are going to be still getting down into the higher 30s. You really don't want the freezing temperatures, but if the temperatures are in the higher 30s, which looking at the long-range forecast, I think we're, we're almost there. So by the end of March, you're safe to put things outside. So planting outside is a little bit different. What I like to, to recommend, our lobster compost is an amazing product for directly sowing vegetable seeds into your garden. I like to put a two inch layer on top of my bed. And the reason for that is there's no weed seeds in there. So when you're planting directly into garden soil, you run the risk of having some weed seeds. So when you're planting your spinach or your lettuce or your sweet peas, and that's gonna germinate, you don't know if it's a weed or if it's a plant. So I like to start with a two inch layer of lobster compost and the benefits are also, you're getting a ton of calcium into the soil and all the micronutrients and the bacteria that's gonna you know, make everything come alive. So for outdoors, I, make a, I like to make a row. You want, I like to plant east to west. So if the sun comes up, I like to plant my rows east to west as opposed to north to south. That's just the way I like to do it and I think they get the maximum sun that way. You wanna space your outdoor beds the size of your hoe. 
because you have to, you know, you have to make sure that you weed between them. Now, so you're planting outside. I always tell people the big mistake a lot of gardeners make is they plant a garden where they can't reach their hand into the middle. So if you're making raised beds or you're making a bed just by raising up the soil, four feet wide is really all you should do. Because if you can't reach your hand into that middle of the garden, at the bed, the weeds are going to take over. So you really have to like pay attention to that. So your seedlings, same process outside, direct sowing into the garden. Three times the size of the seed. So like I said, a big seed like zucchini or beans, I put two in the hole. And when they germinate, I take one out because you really don't want two plants growing together. Carrots are really small. They're really hard to space. Beets are really hard to space. Lettuce is really hard to space. So you have to be diligent. Try your best when you're planting that bed. I like to use like a, you know, just a, make a line and try to drop them as gently as you possibly can. And then gently tap the soil back and then compress it with your hand. And if you do use the worm castings, at that point, I sprinkle the worm castings on top of that compressed area. So every time it rains or I water that seabed, it's getting fed. So those seedlings are gonna have a really good chance of germinating, those seeds. And then once they germinate, you have to thin them. You know, think about a carrot. Carrots are a pretty thick, you know, and if you've ever planted carrots, you you know that they, you know, they'll all come up and you don't want to sacrifice any, but you really have to. Thinning your seed bed is really, really important because you want to give each of the plants a chance to live. Zucchini. Zucchini is so easy to grow from seed. I like to hill up my zucchini, mound my compost, make a hole in the top, put three seeds in there, cover it up, and let it go. Let it germinate, and then the zucchinis will come down. But you should not grow more than three zucchini plants. Trust me on that. Otherwise, you're going to be feeding everybody with zucchini. You know, if you have to have, you know, a couple yellow and a couple green, that's plenty of zucchini. Same with cherry tomatoes. One or two cherry tomatoes. And cherry tomatoes grow really, really well in a container. So when you're planting your seeds, seriously, the seeds will keep. You buy a packet of seeds this year, you plant six tomatoes of one variety, and you give, you know, three to your friends, and you plant three in your garden. I, seeds like to be kept dark and cool. So I put mine in a Ziploc bag and I put them in the refrigerator. I like to date everything. That's the other thing I didn't mention. When you plant inside or outside, invest in these little sticks. Pop, popsicle sticks work or these little white markers. I like to put the name of the variety and the date I planted it. Because you think you're gonna remember, but you don't. You don't remember what's in here. So when that's coming up and you're like, that looks like a tomato, but if you planted brandywine, it looks like a potato. So you really want to do that. And then when you take these out to your garden, at the end of every row, put your little marker so you know when that plant started as a seed, and then you know what it is. That's really important. Um, what else? Anybody have any questions? Pardon me? I'm not a big fan of the fabric because really the soil is alive with micronutrients and you want the plant to be able to get all of them. And if you block the, the fabric, just not in a vegetable garden. I don't have a problem with using fabric in a perennial garden, but not in a vegetable garden. It does warm up the soil earlier, but then I would take it off. Straw hay is a great mulch, but you have to be careful that it has no weed seeds. It has to be like the stuff over there that Lucerne Farm has, because if you don't want to introduce anything into your garden that brings weed seeds. Roger Swain used to say, one year of seed, seven years of weed. And he's absolutely right on that. If you let it go to seed, it's going to haunt you for seven years. So really, try not to introduce 
I also don't like to disturb my bed. That's why I put the lobster compost on the top. I plan into that. I never till it. I'm not a fan of rototillers. Rototillers kill the, the worms and they disrupt the biological activity of the soil. You really want to build healthy soil. And the more compost you can add, the more worm castings you can add, I use newspaper or cardboard to suppress weeds. Like say I want to put a vegetable garden in and I don't have a space. I'll put newspaper or cardboard down to suppress the weeds in that area, but then I'll remove it if it doesn't decompose. The good thing about it is the worms kind of are attracted to it because it's like an insulator. So if you notice when you take that off, the worms are all, um, worms are a really good thing in your garden. Yes, it's because it's compost. Here's the benefit of compost. Compost is teeming with activity, but it's, there's not, you know, that's composted. So there's, the bacteria is not there that you would be allergic to, because that's what the little nematodes are eating first, is the stuff that has any kind of attachment to the lobster. Compost keeps your soil moist. So comes the 4th of July, I never water with the hose. I don't have to bring it out anymore. I make my worm manure tea, and if something needs water, I'll spot water it. But if you have really good, rich soil that's alive with compost, those roots are gonna stay really protected. And really, you know, they're not gonna dry out. So you watch. Building good soil, I can't stress that enough. If you wanna have a productive vegetable garden, you have to build the soil. You can't expect a plant to survive. I would say think of your plants as you think of yourself. You want to, if you eat well and you get, you know, fresh air and sunshine, you stay healthy. You can fight off any kind of colds or viruses. Your plants are the same thing. Their food source is the soil. So you want to spend the time and build that soil. You know, any of the good manures, our compost, bring it, they'll bring that soil to life. Adding worm castings, you can't lose. Don't use synthetic fertilizers or any kind of synthetic soils. You really want to be careful because if you're growing food, you want it to be organic. What about what? Rabbit pellets are fine. Rabbit, llamas, llamas my favorite. I love llama manure. Um, goats, any of that, because they have, they digest their food. Do not use horse manure unless it's your only source and it comes from a really old pile. Because horses don't digest the weed seeds. You, you can put it right in the guard, the pellets, yes. I've used the goats, rabbits, llamas. Those are fine. They're not hot. The horse manure brings weed seeds, so be prepared. I used it one year and I was weeding it for a long time. Cow manure is a little bit better and easier to find. Horse manure, of course, is everywhere where I live. But if it's not decomposed, I would not recommend it. But building you know, the soil with compost is the way to go. What do you mean by that? You can do that, and I use that for weed suppression. Like the heavy black plastic, is great to warm up the soil and to kill off the weeds. But here's the reality. When the nighttime temperatures are above 50, everything's going to grow. So there's really no need to get a jump start. The only thing you need to start now are those long season plants, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. You can even do an experiment. Like I like to start a lot of flower seeds. So I'll start zinnias inside, and then you put those zinnias in the garden, and then you directly sow when the nighttime temperatures are above 50, which is like mid-June, those two zinnias are gonna be almost the same size come the middle of July. I mean, they want warm. They want the soil to be warm. So that's why it's important when you're starting your seeds inside this weekend, good project. Just don't plant that whole packet of tomatoes. Buy three or four varieties and put some away for next year, but don't plant them all. That's why these little packs are good or these little trays. 
Just if you use the P, like I said, you've got to be careful with the moisture. Um, lettuce is so easy to grow. Go ahead. Early flowers that you want to plant in the garden. There's really, sweet peas are the only one that can take the 32 degree nights that we're still going to get for maybe the next two or three weeks. Nasturtiums are the most amazing flower, and it, they're edible. The flowers are edible. They require nothing. You just stick a seed in the garden, and it grows. And the best part about nasturtiums is nobody eats them. No chipmunks, no woodchucks, nobody. So I put nasturtiums everywhere. I mean, my garden's covered in them. And you can eat them. They go in every salad, sandwich. Do you have a question? That's, that's why the sweet peas and the snow peas, they're attracted to those. That's why I like to give them a little head start. I use cutworm collars, which are um, just paper cups that I cut, the little bathroom size paper cups or you could use a toilet paper roll that you cut in thirds. And I put those around my seedlings when I first put them out. Anything thinner than your thumb, than your pinky. Because it's really devastating to go out, you've nurtured this plant for six weeks and have it lopped off by some cutworm or slug. You really want to protect them. So I, like it, I encourage you to put them out when they're a little bit stronger. And tomatoes, when you're planting tomatoes, and this, this would work, so you've got your tomatoes inside, they're about you know four inches tall, they have a couple sets of leaves, you're ready to move them into the next size pot, you can bury that stem. You can bury that stem up to that level of leaves. So everything below the surface is going to turn into roots. I love to use the worm castings or the lobster compost in the hole when I'm planting them outside. So I put the lobster compost in the hole, I'll backfill with more lobster compost. And then critical is to compress around the plant. So this applies to everything that you put in your garden. Vegetables, perennials, annuals, trees and shrubs. You want to compress the soil to make like a well so that when you're watering, the water is collecting right there at the base of the plant. Nothing makes me crazier than people with the hose going like this. Because what you're doing is you're, you're inviting fungus. Because if you're watering too late in the day and that plant doesn't have enough time to dry out before the, you know, before the sun sets, those leaves are gonna, they're gonna wilt. You wanna make sure you water at the base. I know it takes a little bit extra effort, but just hold the hose at the base. And the other thing, when that plant's in the ground and it's got its little lobster compost all around it and it's got its little water well, you wanna water it till you think you can't give it any more water. And then you want to let it be. Don't water it every day. Give it a lot of water and let it look, let the roots look for water. That's another mistake a lot. Of, I always say plants want to live. We kill them by overloving them. And overwatering something is critical. You don't want to do that. And if you do have to use an overhead sprinkler, say your garden is too big, make sure you do it early in the morning so that that plant has all day to dry out in the sun. And then as the days get shorter towards the end of the year, you really want to not do that unless you absolutely have to. Because the plants and vegetable gardens, the reality folks, unless it's a green crop like lettuce or spinach, they need eight to 10 hours a day of sunlight. So you have to look at your garden and say, do I have that? If you want something that fruits or flowers, it needs eight to 10 hours of sunlight. Or, you know, greens are okay. You can get away with greens having six hours or so. But um, everybody should plan on growing lettuce next week, spinach, kale, all those cold weather hardy green crops. Just get your lobster compost, put your layer down, make your seed, put your seeds in. Just don't bury them too deep. Same technique, pack down the soil, make a compression with your hand and just water where you planted them. Don't water in between because you don't want to encourage weeds. Weeds are just like everything else. They want sunlight and water. Yep. If you have a really sunny southern facing window, 
you can put them in that. But you have to turn them all the time because they are going to grow towards the light and you're going to have, you know, a tray with a lot of seeds. The fluorescent fixtures are not that expensive. Those are fine. You don't need any fancy garden grow lights. Just straight fluorescent fixtures. And I bought one of those metal racks that you see at every hardware store, home center, that then you, and the, the lights are on chains. So as your plants grow up, you can lift, you know, you can move the chains up. Well, at this, when they're only this big, I like them close. And then as the plants grow, I move them up. Once they germinate, they want light. That's all they want. Before they germinate, they want heat. They want warm feet, I say, you know, make me warm underneath. And then once they've germinated, they want sunlight. Just be careful if you use the domes. I like the domes because it does encourage um, germination quicker but don't let the water condensation uh, accumulate. Take it off, dry it out, and then put it back, especially if you don't have them in a sunny spot. Any other questions? Yes. Celery and leeks are pretty easy. Um, they just want nice, loamy soil. I mean, and carrots and beets, anything that goes in the ground. They want soil that they can grow in. Onions are so easy to grow, and nobody eats them. I mean, you can plant a row of onions in between a row of carrots and, you know, just trick them. Also, another thing that I, I, have, I forgot to mention, crop rotation is very important. That's why keeping track of what you have and where it's planted is very important, because you don't want to plant the same thing in the same soil every single year. You want to give that soil two years. One year you'll have a, I like to say three years. One year you'll have a tomato there, the next year you'll have beans there. Then you can have peppers and lettuce. You want to alternate crops. Crop rotation is very important because pests and diseases tend to be attracted to certain things, so you want to trick them. I'm always looking for ways to eliminate pests and diseases. And the best thing that I have found, healthy plants. So build healthy soil and your plants will be healthy and they will fight off pests and diseases. Yes. Yeah. The squash bugs are pretty evident. The other thing is don't plant a vegetable garden and take a week off in August. It just doesn't work. You have to be committed to that garden. And it's really, if you have the really good soil and you have enough sunlight and you're careful with the amount of water, you can see when a plant is hurting. So you go out every day, just even in the morning, go out with a cup of coffee or at night with a glass of wine. The day that squash bug gets in that squash vine, you'll know it. I take it out with a knife. You know, I go in, you can see it, it's pretty big. Squash has a um, hollow, you know, the stem is hollow. So you can go, you can see where it went in and you can scoop it out. And that's the best, I like to do things organically. I really don't like, I, I use the worm tea or I'll make a lobster manure um, compost tea and I feed things with that. Um, or a, a fish emulsion also works. And then nasturtiums have helped. There's um, a marigold called lemon gem that's also edible and it's really pretty. I like to grow edible flowers in with my vegetables because you're gonna be spending a lot of time in that garden. So you want it to be pretty. Calendula is another really good edible flower. So nasturtiums, the lemon gem marigolds, which come in orange and yellow, and um, calendula are the three really easy to grow from seed edible flowers. So I would encourage everybody to grow them. Nasturtiums, I'm not kidding, they want, they don't want anything fancy. Any, how are we doing on time? Are we okay? Okay. I can keep talking. I can answer questions. I can keep talking. Yes. Oh, I did earlier, yeah. You want to make sure that you harden them off. So you're not taking your plants from in the house and putting them right into the garden. You want, that's what I said, six to eight weeks. You want to spend the last two weeks. I like to spend two weeks bringing them outside, taking them in, bringing them out during the day, taking them in at night so that they're getting a chance to acclimate, just like us. 
you know, now we're all used to the warm, you know, weather. So you go outside and it's, you know, you're inside and it's heated. You go outside, it's cold. Same with your plants. Plants are alive. You want to treat them like that. You know, they want good food and they want sunlight. That's it. They're really easy. I like to use the inoculin when I plant them. Um, inoculin is just, I'm not actually sure what it is, but you buy it where you buy your seeds. And I like to put my, um, any of the uh, beans, peas in water and then in the inoculin before I put them in the soil. Um, Cause that helps to germinate them. Flower seeds you would pre, you could pre-treat. Seed packets are amazing with the amount of information. Every seed is different. So you want to really look at the back of the seed packet. And you know, they're, the companies out there today have gotten so sophisticated with the information on the seed packets. I also left my card out here in our Coast Domain brochure and a handout with the seed starting basics. Just the you know, techniques that you should all have. So take those. My email is on there, my cell phone. I'm always available. If you have a question, you're out there and you have something you haven't, you don't know the answer to, I can help you. For 20 years, I've been doing this. That's a long time. Anybody have? Yeah. The sprinkler system, have it go on really early in the morning with the hose, but again, really early in the morning. You want to be able to have the leaves dry by the time the sun sets. That's the goal. And it doesn't really, that applies to all plants. I mean, not just your vegetable garden, all your beds. Yes. Uh, absolutely, and too much water. Combination, you don't want to water from above. Really, it's not, it's really easy to water from the base. I also like to mulch around my tomatoes with grass clippings, only if you have an organic lawn. So if you have an organic lawn, not right up against the tomato, I leave my water well, so my plant has you know the, the soil, just the compost around it. But then around it, I like to compress it with um, grass clippings because that helps with the backsplash, you know, so that the rainwater is not hitting the plant. And it also um, keeps the soil cool in the summer because that plant's gonna be in the ground for five months. So you want to make sure that soil is really moist and rich. Any other questions? There right inside the brochure, that white piece of paper is my um, seed starting handout. Really it's not that difficult. You just have to start, make sure you have good soil, can't stress that enough, don't overwater. always water from the bottom. And if they're dry on the top, just a light spritz is all they need. They don't want a lot of water, but they also don't want to ever dry out. Try, um, try a fish emulsion spray, like a foliar feed. They may not eat, eat it if you spray it with a fish. Yeah, dilute it in water and use a sprayer I find that that tends to work, to discourage them from eating the fruit. And we have more of the bags, if anybody think. No. Um, garden centers. We have a dealer locator on, on our website. So you just plug in your zip code. I, I would say that every independent garden center in New England carries Coast of Maine. And if they don't, they can get it. So put your zip code in our dealer locator and you'll find a place near you.